I'd like to welcome you all to this event organized by the Institute of Human Rights at University College London. Um, I'd like to point out that it's such a, a well-attended event, and we haven't had such a large and well-attended event in quite a while here, and this is, it's, it's really pleasing to see so many people interested in such an important and pressing subject. Um, I want to just start with a, a number, a figure. Um, UCL had a campaign which finished recently, and the campaign was to raise money from donations and phil from philanthropic sources uh, to advance research projects through the university. And the, the project, or the campaign, was uh, had set its benchmark at 300 million pounds. And the campaign fi finished recently, and the final amount is 316 million pounds that the university managed to raise from philanthropic donations. Now that's a lot of money. I mean, it may not be a lot of money to a government, and it may not be a lot of money to a, an NGO, but to a university, that's an incredible resource for advancing research in numerous and important areas. And the areas that a lot of this finance will go to include the grand challenges that UCL is pursuing. For example, the grand challenges, a grand challenge in intercultural interactions, which is under, uh, under that grand challenge that the Institute of Human Rights operates. But of course, with an enormous amount of money like that comes a number of questions. And the questions are about what that money represents in terms of power of the people behind the money, power of influence or power of agenda setting, given that you have donated, say, a few million, do you have a say in what the research that comes out or is, is pursued with that money will say? Do you have any kind of control? UCL Council recently passed an explicit ethical commitment, which has been implicit, but it's recognized throughout the university that the commitment to give money to UCL does not guarantee you, does not give you any kind of influence in the, in the research that comes out at the end. That it's freedom of academic inquiry is guaranteed irrespective of where the money is coming from. But still the questions remain in the background as to whether philanthropic organizations fi financing academic research can have some, some kind of nefarious influence on agendas. And not only on agendas of universities, but also the agendas of the pursuit of legal recourse in this country, and how that legal recourse, especially in the area of human rights, might influence the direction that is taken by our democracy and our parliamentary system. And of course, this has been greatly in the news lately also. So having said all that, which in a way lays some of the background, and also perhaps pointing to cases in other universities, I don't want to be mean about sort of competitive organizations, but in other universities where philanthropy has been connected with um, scandals in the press um, about certain <laughs> sons of certain important figures of state, the, the question is posed. And the Institute of Human Rights wanted to, if you like, lance this boil. We didn't want this kind of thing to be floating around. We, we wanted it to be in the open and discussed transparently and hence the organization of this event. Our institute has received, and as you will see from the brochures you, you get, and so here's a point of declaration, we've received money from philanthropic sources. In, in this case, this symposium is part of a series of human rights events that have been taking place, the Human Rights, Pentland Human Rights Symposium, and they are financed with assistance from an organization called the Pentland Group, which is known for its philanthropic giving in the areas of human rights and its advancement of the cause of corporate social responsibility. That's out in the open. We, we can discuss the ethics of that also in, in the ensuing discussion. And um, I can say without reservation that all the monies that we receive and given have always been with the understanding that once given, the money influences nothing other than that it will actually be just resources for research and, and the production of events like, like this one that actually allows all of you to be here today. Having said all that, the Institute organizes 
numerous events throughout the year, we also organise interventions of the kind that maybe have been questioned as agenda setting. We provided a, uh, a submission to the Commission on the Bill of Rights that the government set up to discuss the possibility of a Bill of Rights in this country, and we submitted a document to that. And we recently had an event on the right to work, which some people would see as problematic and difficult uh, if from a certain political perspective. We continue to influence and engage in the human rights sector using academic research to bring the latest findings and the latest uh, uh, views to the fore in debates on the direction that human rights are taking. And today, you're going to see, hopefully, some of that. I'm sure you will see some of that because we have a very distinguished panel who, will come, who have come to speak to you precisely on this issue of the ethics of human rights philanthropy and the ethics of philanthropy uh, influencing research more generally. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Philippe, who will introduce that panel to you so that we can continue with the debate and discussion. Thank you very much, Saladin. Thank you very much to our audience for coming on a what might be the last beautiful day for months on end. And thank you to our uh, very distinguished panel I'll be pleased to introduce uh, as we begin. Just by way of background, I'm very delighted that the Centre has put on this uh, event. It touches on an issue that is obviously of importance, the fact that you are uh, all here. Preparing for it, we've had a range of conversations amongst ourselves, and obviously there are a range of different views on the issue that we're going to talk about, the ethics of human rights philanthropy. Some of those views, uh, other views may no doubt exist that are not represented on the panel. They may be in the audience, and we encourage you very much uh, after the panel session to come up uh, with questions. A approaching this, I have looked at it wearing two hats. I have obviously my UCL hat as an academic, but I also have a hat as a barrister litigating uh, lots of cases. And I'm acutely aware that at the bar, the, the rule is somehow the very opposite. You are precluded from turning down money, whoever it may come from, in respect to whatever cause, because we have something called the cab rank principle, which is just to accept whatever vast sums or not are thrown at you to argue whatever case someone um, wants to argue and whatever you personally feel about it. And so the upshot is you get involved in a raft uh, of different cases. <coughs> one of the cases that I'm doing right now is the one that dare not speak its name involving a certain individual who um, gave a rather large sum of money to very good friends of mine at an institution uh, down the road who I'm sure genuinely believed they were uh, acting in good faith and doing the right thing. And it's caused all sorts of difficulties that has thrown up these kinds of issues. It does also <laughs> mean that when you are arguing the case at the International Criminal Court in relation to probably the first person with a doctorate from the LSE who has ever found himself in the dock uh, at the International Criminal Court, people remember this. It has resonated far and wide as an issue that people are interested in. So there is plainly an interest. I know too from litigating cases that the sources of funding for the litigation of cases comes from everywhere. I've been involved in cases in which behind the scenes you have uh, large corporate interests litigating test cases. Uh, I've been involved in cases in which you have <laughs> useless chair. in which governments provide support to NGOs or to other governments that then use some of those funds to litigate cases or are able to litigate cases because they don't have to find from other places. And I've been involved in cases in which uh, trusts and foundations have made uh, monies available. So the context in which we have this conversation, I think, has to be uh, a much broader conversation. Next week I have a very dear friend who's coming over from uh, the United States uh, to do a panel at the Hay Literary Festival, uh, a wonderful journalist called Jane Mayer who writes for The New Yorker. She is the journalist who for the first time set out what a group of brothers called the Koch brothers uh, have been doing in terms of funding litigation amongst other things in relation to corporate interests. So I think it's very important as we have this conversation to imagine it as part of a broader debate and a broader context at a time when the monopoly of the state has been broken 
and where funds come from a range of different uh, sources. And I suspect that one of the things that will emerge uh, as a major theme is the issue of transparency. I think we all feel a lot better about things when we know what is happening and that matters are being done openly and transparently. It's when that breaks down that the problems begin to arise. And I think we're all aware of circumstances where that can happen. On the other hand, there are also very good reasons why sometimes people or corporations or groups or foundations don't want it publicly known what it is that they are doing or what it is that they are funding. And so there are genuinely complex issues uh, that have to be sorted out. And it's in that spirit that we're engaging in this conversation. Without further ado, can I introduce our first speaker, Anthony Tomai, who is the director of the Nuffield Foundation. You've each of you got, I think, little booklets so you can uh, see that he has a very distinguished career. We've agreed we're not going to read out the full extent of everyone's distinguished career. Um, Anthony, if I could invite you to begin. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, so the Nuffield Foundation uh, was founded in 1943 uh, by William Morris, Lord Duffield. So it's a mature foundation, if you like. There's no connection with the family or the founder. Um, the, we don't have anything as vulgar as a mission statement, but there is a statement in the, there's a, a sentence in the trustee which talks about the advancement of social well-being, particularly by scientific research. And that is, in effect, our, our, our mission statement. And it's a, it's a statement of enlightenment values, and that's fundamentally what drives us, the idea that knowledge, evidence, and understanding will lead to better human outcomes in the long term. I'd like to make two preparatory remarks before um, my, my brief is to, to, to say something about how foundations make their decisions. And before I do that, I, a couple of preparatory remarks. The first is that, that foundations are extremely varied. Um, the cliche in, in, in our trade is that when you know one foundation, you know one foundation, ho ho. Um, the, the, the term foundation actually has no legal status in the UK. It does in other countries, but in the UK it doesn't. Anybody can call themselves a foundation. But what people normally are referring to uh, when they use the term is charitable endowed foundations. That's to say uh, foundations that are, first of all, uh, registered as charities, and secondly, have an endowment, that is to say, some of their own money. And endowed charitable foundations do have, I think, two things in common. The first is that they are charities, which means they're subject to charity law. And our responsibilities as foundations in that sense are no more or less than for any other charity. We don't have any particular status as charities. The second is that what the endowment gives you, apart from the ability to buy things, is independence. And that, for me, is the characteristic, the fundamental characteristic of foundations, the thing that makes them different from everything else. How they choose to use that independence is up to them. Um, and the outcomes are, in fact, very varied. Uh, in my view, that's entirely a good thing. Uh, and I'll say more about that later, perhaps. So it follows from that that what I'm saying, uh, what I'm going to say, is uh, entirely about, is about how Nuffield works, is entirely factual. Um, I'm not trying to say that the way we operate is, in some sense, superior, better than other ways, or that foundations should operate in the same way as us. Um, other foundations make their own minds up and will come to different conclusions, and that's entirely a good thing, I think. Pluralism is one of the great strengths of, a, of this sector. The other point I want to make is that I claim no personal expertise in the field of human rights. It's not one of our priority areas, uh, although we do fund the odd project in it, which I can talk about. So in that sense, I'm very much seen as the warm-up act, I think, and you'll get the real, uh, the real McCoy later. So, what I've been asked to do in these opening remarks is to give some background on the practice of a large foundation like Nuffield, um, and in particular, what, how we make decisions. So the background to this is that Nuffield spends about £12 million a year. That doesn't change very much. And we spend it mainly, but not entirely, on research and development. And as part of that, um, research and development, there's a phrase I, I, which I came across recently from the Robbins Report, of blessed memory, where Robin said that there were foundation, uh, sorry, universities had three functions. One was to teach, one was to do research, and one was to engage in what he called reflective inquiry, which I think is a lovely phrase and has been lost, and I urge you all to use it, because I think reflective inquiry is a lot of what we need, obviously informed by research. 
And that's quite a lot of what we fund is, in some sense, is reflective inquiry. So we work mainly in the fields of education and social policy. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail of that, but within social policy, which is the area we're most concerned with here, I suspect, we have programmes in children and families and in law and society. Now, that last programme is mainly concerned with civil law and with socio-legal research in particular. We also reserve about 15% of the budget each year for what we call the open door, which is a kind of open category, um, which covers a, a wider range of things outside those priority areas. Um, most are concerned with poverty and disadvantage in one form or another, but we, we are fun other things too, including work on constitutional issues and, uh, and things of that sort. We want the research we support to uh, inform and to influence policy and practice. And so we're very active, probably unusually so for foundation, in helping our grant holders to disseminate their research. Uh, to do that, we, we run or encourage and pay for or encourage others to run seminars, workshops, events like this, um, to which we invite not just academics, but also practitioners, policy makers, and we make a lot of use of our networks, which are extensive, and one of the, uh, particularly in the policy world, and researchers often don't have these, particularly researchers in universities, so that's one way in which we feel we can add value to the research that we fund. We're also increasingly engaged, and here I think we may be getting to the territory of what is and isn't legitimate influence, uh, in thinking about, not just about how the research can be thought about and used, as it were, downstream, but also how it's framed upstream. Uh, the issue here is, not surprisingly, policymakers uh, are much more are likely to be much more receptive to a piece of research that, uh, that comes on their desks if they know that it's coming, uh, if they know that it, it fits into some uh, timetable of policy decisions that are needed, and possibly if they've had some part in shaping it, which doesn't necessarily mean that they commission it. it certainly for us it doesn't mean that. But nonetheless, the engagement of policymakers, as it were, upstream of what's done uh, in research can be, very, can be very important in long-term influence. So that may be something we want to come back to. Turning to decision-making, I think the, the, the fundamentals um, will be very familiar to most of you in this room. We always use peer review, um, and we're very rigorous about methodologies. Um, <coughs> foundations are supposed to take risks. That's, one of the, that's another of our cliches that we tell ourselves. But we don't take risks with the quality of research. And that, I think, is a very important distinction. We may take risks on the topic and the subject and the potential for influence, but we don't take risks on the quality. Um, we, have a, we fund a lot of quantitative research. That doesn't mean we have a tilt that way. For us, the big issue is, is the method, are the methodologies right for the particular questions? And in practice, I think the decision that they can be complex in, and they vary from case to pe case, but ultimately I think it boil, they boil down to three things. First of all, is it a good research proposal? Is the methodology right? Are the people the right people to do it? Is it value for money? Things of that sort. Secondly, is the question an important one? Are the results needed? Does it stand a reasonable chance of having some influence on policy? We're very averse to so what research. And thirdly, and probably most important in the light of what I was saying earlier about pluralism, why should the foundation fund it? There are other much bigger funders out in the world. Um, we have significant funds, but they're certainly very limited relative to, say, the ESRC, government departments, and so on. So why is the government, why is the foundation the right choice of funder? Um, so I, I won't go into that in detail. Perhaps we could come back to that later. It's not just about the issue of the value added. It's the issue of where independent uh, funding for research has some particular reason, some particular reason why you would want it independently funded rather than funded by uh, a government or other kind of body. So that, again, back, gets back, I think, to the key issue here. I have some examples, but I think perhaps I'll leave them and, and pass it. I'll come back to them at the end. Thank you very much. Anthony, um, I now come to my colleague George Letzis, who is a reader in law here at UCL and also involved in the Centre on Human Rights. George. Thank you, Luke. Um, 
I have chosen to concentrate on a very specific issue to do with black and queer human rights. I'm not going to talk about universities and research, academic research. I'm going to focus on the issue of funding litigation, human rights litigation. Um, now, a large uh, part of philanthropic donation goes to human rights organizations and NGOs. And a big part of what these organizations do is litigate cases uh, before human rights bodies, some of which, uh, if they're not domestic courts, uh, maybe international courts like the European Court of Human Rights, and some of which make decisions that are binding on the state. And this kind of litigation is, is very uh, particular. It's one in which an individual is submitting a claim against the state. So the parties to the dispute is the state versus the individual, the individual versus the state. Now, NGOs are an essential part of that practice of human rights, the human rights movement. And they're involved in litigation in two ways, uh, either by directly offering representation, legal representation, uh, to uh, people who claim to be victims of human rights violation, or by submitting intervention, third-party intervention, to important cases. Uh, there's a, a procedure for this. Courts allow uh, NGOs to submit uh, briefs, uh, either on questions of fact or questions of law. That part of the human rights movement has been essential to the development of the cases, the case law, uh, essential to uh, unearthing important issues of human rights violation, to remedying wrongs, important wrongs, uh, throughout the world. So there's a great value in that part of the NGO, NGO involvement with human rights litigation. But we have this uh, issue, however, at the same time, that it's clear that the money given to the NGOs or the human rights organization will be used partly for litigation. It's also clear that uh, the NGOs have an outcome they want to reach, a particular outcome. They're not neutral to the outcome of the case. They want the applicant to win. They want the state to lose. There's no neutrality or partiality. There's partiality. There's no impartiality. It's unlike a university professor writing an article, an academic article in the state of the law. Now, the NGO wants uh, the human rights applicant to win and the state to lose. And the donors are aware of that, and they give the money uh, in the knowledge that it will be used to try to achieve an outcome. Now, this outcome may sometimes have impact not just for the individual involved in the case, but for a great number of other people. Uh, human rights outcomes, particularly in cases like the UK, where you have the Human Rights Act, or uh, in European countries in general, under the ECHR, uh, a win in Strasbourg may mean the need to change the law. And that may affect a large number of people. It's not just the person who wins compensation or the money that the state may have to pay. It's not just uh, the measures that the state may have to take in relation to that particular person, the applicant. It may mean large-scale um, changes which may affect other people and negatively affect other people. Uh, which is why many NGOs and many organizations involved are involved in what's called strategic litigation. Right? They, they try to find cases that not only think they're meritorious, they're victims of violations, but they want to uh, push a change uh, in the law. So there is a bit of an issue there, right? Private money is used to affect an outcome in a process which is public, it's litigation, uh, and it, it, it is used to affect outcomes that uh, affect state uh, resources, affect the law, the law may have to change. So there might be a question mark there. Uh, how is this money been given, under what conditions, and how is it used? Now, um, we worry about this because we worry about this in general, right? So uh, we worry when private money is used to influence outcomes, that are policy outcomes, political issues, outside the normal process of elections and democracy. So uh, people in the US worry a lot about corporations using their money to affect elections, affect the political process. Uh, sadly, uh, the US Supreme Court hasn't seen the risk in that. In the most recent judgment, they overturned decades of case law and they allowed um, rich corporations to donate uh, money used for supporting particular candidates uh, under the uh, freedom uh, of speech, First Amendment uh, basis. Um, so, so you might think that if there is an issue about money, private money being in influencing political process and outcomes, there might be also an issue about private money and NGOs influencing judicial outcomes. And for some people, uh, there might be a thin line between uh, applying the law and making the law. Very often you hear about people complaining that courts 
no longer applying the law, they make new laws. So if, if people are allowed to influence judicial outcomes, that might be equivalent to being allowed to use your to influence legislation. Now, I think uh, all these worries and concerns are not valid, and I'm going to explain why. Um, first of all, we worry about uh, private money influencing policy issues, but those policy issues that democratically we are legitimately allowed to take, where to build an airport, whether to give subsidies to farmers or agriculture, and so on. But the core issues of human rights are not issues left to the normal political process. Whether people have right not to be tortured, <coughs> whether people are free from persecution, uh, whether people are, uh, have a right to life, the core issues of human rights are not the ones that uh, in modern democracies, we allow the normal political process to decide. We think that these are outside the normal political process, people have these rights, and it's not up to parliament, or up to majority rather, to decide to restrict them. So the role of courts there is to be the guardians of those values and principles that are not to be decided by majorities, uh, but rather a matter of principle, not a matter of policy. So that immediately uh, changes the nature of human rights education, because the role of courts there not just to apply the will of the majority, it's rather to uphold certain issues to do with fundamental principles of modern democracies. Uh, and that in itself is very important. And I want to uh, suggest two more reasons why the role of NGOs is, is very important uh, after we've seen that human rights raise issues of principle, not policy. Now the first is that most of the victims that NGOs help in mitigating rights are in a, in a position of disadvantage. But for the assistance of NGOs, they wouldn't have brought their claim, their meritorious claim, either because of lack of means, financial means, or because of ignorance. A large part of the work of NGOs involves helping immigrants, asylum seekers, members of minorities like the Romans in Europe, people who, without this support, they wouldn't be able to bring their claims to light, to have a remedy, to have litigation. And that disadvantage is, so to speak, absolute, right? It's about the conditions. And that is a large number of claims. If you look at the European Court of Human Rights case law, uh, particularly from the former, from the new, new member states, the Eastern states, most of the people who, the cases go to court held by uh, human rights organizations are people who are really in desperate need of representation. And legal aid is very rarely sufficient to help those people. So that's an essential NGO there based on philanthropic funding, perform an essential function of helping people and helping make all those claims. But there's another uh, reason why we need the NGOs to play this role, which is that there's an inherent imbalance of power between the parties to dispute. You have an individual versus the state. The state not only has a strong team of lawyers in its apparatus, they control the state mechanism. They control, in effect, the fate of the applicant, and they can use this control to obstruct the process of litigation to obstruct the, the procedure. So helping those who claim to be human rights victims of violation through uh, allowing NGOs to uh, represent them, make submissions, uh, sometimes about findings of fact, disappearances, and so on, uh, remedies this imbalance of power between state and the individual. Now, to me, this suggests that the NGOs, thanks to the funding they get, the philanthropic funding, are allowed to play a public role of a watchdog public role of the watchdog to counterbalance the power of the state, to help weaker members of uh, weaker human rights victims that wouldn't bring the case other, the claim otherwise. And precisely because of that public role of the watchdog, I think there's an important requirement of transparency for the NGOs. So unlike uh, corporations and lawyers who may you know, not, not have to uh, be transparent uh, perhaps about where they receive their funding, when it comes to NGOs, I think it's important for them to declare where they get their money from, and it's important that um, NGOs and litigation is not receiving money from powerful corporations whose aim is not to support victims of what are called core human rights violations. Now, you may think that this line between core human rights issues in which NGOs should and help, and other issues that may not be so clearly human rights issues, is a very thin line. Uh, but I think most of us, unlike often a populist part of the press, unlike uh, perhaps some of the sort of debates in this country, we are pretty clear about what is a clear human rights issue and what isn't. And we may disagree about particular cases. I don't think there's a much debate about that the court 
mostly get it right. They promote and protect meritorious claims. They develop principles that are very clear and are legal. Uh, and uh, we may debate particular cases, but I don't think there's an issue that uh, most of the work done by NGOs in helping victims of human rights are for the good cause of protecting victims of human rights who would otherwise be not allowed to do so. George, I mean, the questions are already are beginning to pull up. I just want to ask actually one thing, just to be clear. You, Nuffield doesn't fund litigation or research that is closely related to litigation, or is that not right? We don't fund litigation. Uh, research that's close to it, um, can we come back to that? Sure. I mean, that's a, a broader... Give <laughs> time to think about yeah. it. And, uh, yeah. Very good. Um, we now come to my colleague at UCL, but not in the Law Faculty, Professor at the Philosophy uh, Faculty, Joe Wolfe. Joe. Thanks very much. Uh, so I, I've been asked to talk about universities receiving money. Very interesting topic. Uh, but I want to start with a bit of philosophy. And uh, this is a, a view which is sometimes attributed to a Cambridge philosopher about 100 years ago, G.E. Moore. Now, uh, Moore argued that we are morally responsible for the consequences of everything that we do, good or bad. Uh, he also argued that it is very hard to know what the consequences of your actions are. And he also argued that doing bad was worse than doing good is good, if you understand <laughs> that. Uh, from which he deduced that the best thing to do was as little as possible. <laughs> and uh, what he recommended was that you should engage in conversation with your uh, inspiring friends and contemplate beautiful objects. Uh, because this way you would do very little harm. Uh, he was a member of the Bloomsbury group, meeting around the corner, so he had lots of opportunities for both of those things. So should we all act like G. Moore? and uh, make sure that as a, our prime motivation is not to cause harm in the world. Well, um, I think we're used to the notion of the problem of dirty hands. Uh, I like to think of this as the problem of clean hands. That is, if we're all concerned to keep our hands clean, then nothing will get done. And it, we see this in all walks of life now. So on the one hand, you know, we're all uh, very opposed to the health and safety culture. If you say you're a health and safety, no one who's a health and safety officer will admit this to a party. <laughs> uh, we think they're meddling and intrusive, but as soon as a child you know, breaks an arm in a playground, we think you know, this is terrible, they shouldn't have allowed that, we should close it down. So the tricky thing is to try to get the balance right. You know, what is reasonable risk-taking? The opt socially optimum amount of risk-taking is not zero. But if you're taking risks, bad things will happen. If you're concerned never to let bad things happen, you'll never take risks, and you won't get the benefits of risk-taking either. And so this is a problem for universities in accepting funds. And you know, we have to be you know, moderately realistic about this. There are foundations that are completely driven by the research agenda. Um, foundations that are funded from the estate of someone long dead are probably perfect in this respect, because there's no current vested interest. If you're taking money from a business person, or taking money from business, why are they giving you that money? You know, what is their interest in you having it? And very often, uh, a corporation will be trying to launder their reputation in some way. Uh, you know, some years ago, we had, uh, there was a Centre for Philosophy at King's College that was funded by Shell. Uh, this was just after Brent Spa. And um, Shell were funding you know, small philanthropic activities out of its, in effect, its marketing and communication budget. Does that mean we shouldn't have taken the money? In fact, we had a great debate, a whole day conference uh, funded by Shell, and the conference <laughs> turned into whether we should be taking <laughs> Shell's money to have this conference funded by Shell. It was fantastic. Um, and, you know, we, we thought that, uh, you know, 
or with philosophers. It's complicated. There's more than one view that you can have on, on this matter. But the, the general notion, I think, it is clear that there is a level of reasonable risk-taking. There's something which is being far too cautious, and there's something which is being reckless. And where do you draw that line? Now, um, before the recent interest in, in these issues, I was asked by UCL Council to chair a little group on um, principles for accepting donations. Uh, in fact, a few years ago, uh, I'd been asked to give some advice to a committee that was setting up an ethical investment policy. It's weird that UCL had uh, some uh, debates, the student groups were protesting about some of the UCL investments into uh, arms companies. This is stop the arms trade and disinvest from the arms trade campaign going on. Um, and, well, it was interesting they asked me advice. Someone thought that if you're a moral philosopher, you might be able to give moral counsel, which is actually a very bad idea. It doesn't, doesn't happen at all. Um, but uh, I, I thought, well, this is an interesting intellectual exercise anyway. So what advice would you give? Uh, if you're um, going to advise on, in fact, reasonable risk-taking, i.e. reasonable do donation policy in this respect, what do you do? And, you know, certain things were obvious. The notion of independence was clear. That, that came up and wasn't contested. That is, you shouldn't allow the funder to dictate the research you do. Uh, another issue we thought was very important was that you shouldn't allow funders to fund research where the fact that they're funding it might cast doubt on the results of the research. Um, so this is really about funding a particular type of project rather than taking money from a particular funder. So, for example, you wouldn't want to take money from the alcohol industry to investigate alcoholism, for example, because that would, whatever you say, it would cast doubt, the funding source would cast doubt on the research. Another issue I, I thought of, I don't know if uh, UCL eventually followed this, but um, though every university's got a mission statement, we could say we won't take any money that's not in accordance with our mission statement. I, we won't do anything that will contradict our goals. And this has actually looked quite good for a while. Um, maybe it still does, because people could say, well, one of our missions is to advance human health. Uh, tobacco companies, they produce a product which is very dangerous for human health. Therefore, we won't take any money from tobacco companies. Wonderful, principled position, which the university has already adopted. Uh, was that because of our high-handed, uh, high-minded uh, adherence to these principles, or was it because the Wellcome Trust wouldn't fund anyone who took money from tobacco companies? <laughs> I wonder. Okay. So I, I think that there are examples where uh, big funders are influencing the research that goes on in universities because you know, they can tell you they will whether they'll fund you or not. And some universities have got into trouble about this. That there'd been, uh, I can't remember who it was, but last year a university began a research project with a tobacco company and were warned by the Wellcome Trust that they might have their funding cut off if they continued with it. So that was an interesting dilemma for them about uh, academic independence. So I think there is uh, uh, such a thing as reasonable risk-taking. We need a code of practice. And you know, one of the pressing questions, really, in this debate is whether um, the LSC took a reasonable risk or whether they acted in an unreasonable way. Um, some people have been confused by my surname. I'm not Lord Wolf. <laughs> I'm not related to Lord Wolf. I don't spell my name the same way as him. But uh, I, I was involved in, in a different way in that situation because at the same time you remember as the, there was an investigation into the donations, uh, there was also an investigation into allegations of plagiarism. And I was on the University of London panel that was investigating the allegations of plagiarism. And as part of that, I interviewed many of the people who were involved in supervision of thesis and, and their uh, reasons for admitting Scythe Gaddafi into the program. And yeah, a lot of them were you know, incredibly upset, obviously, about turn of events, and um, particularly the role that, that he played. And you know, I came away, really, I think, with the view that, that if Saif Gaddafi had managed to find the courage to stand up to his father, the LSE might well be winning prizes now for its prescience. Um, so there is a phenomenon that we describe, we philosophers describe as moral luck, 
Um, and I think LSE had incredibly bad moral luck, as it turned out. And they could have had very good moral luck. And we would be slapping people on the back and saying how far-sighted they were. Um, the members of the LSE philosophy department who were involved in, in this had, had been asked to draft a new constitution for Libya. And they had drafted a constitution that in many ways, it wasn't a model constitution, it, had, it, it, it mentioned uh, aspects of religion, I think, that lots of you know, secular constitutions wouldn't have, but it was a type of human rights document. And was, these academics thought they were introducing a new constitution for Libya. It might not happen this year, but it might be 10 years' time or 20 years' time. And it all blew up in their faces. I would say that, looking back, they probably did some, some things a bit quickly. They didn't look at every... Bit, they, you know, there wasn't the full level of scrutiny, but you know, if they'd had a high level of scrutiny, they might have turned down things that would have been very valuable. So I think that it's all very well to um, look at things in the hindsight and say they shouldn't have done certain things, um, but I think it's still possible to think that they, broadly speaking, did the right things. Possible to say that. Right? So I don't think the issue is as cut and dry as it is often said to be. Thank you for that. I, ha I had no idea you'd been involved in that. I, I wrote a piece last August for a magazine um, in the course of which I interviewed Saif Gaddafi's speechwriter uh, who had written the speech he was supposed to give on the night of the 20th of February, uh, went home to his little house in Tripoli, switched on the television at midnight and was appalled to see that Saif Gaddafi was not giving the speech that had been carefully written out and prepared but was giving a different speech. And that point that you make, I think, is absolutely right. If the speechwriter's speech and the speech that was actually written had been given, we may indeed have a very different view. Um, and the question that arises here is, should a university in those circumstances get into that degree of detail? And it's, it, it's fa very fair, I think, the way that you've put it. These are often um, tough Calls, which brings us to our final uh, panellist for this uh, evening, um, Sigrid Rousing. And Sigrid is the founder of the Sigrid Rousing Trust, and she's going to talk about uh, well, what you want to talk about. Um, so um, I'm not going to say very much because so much has already been said. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what we do we fund uh, about 150 organizations. Um, we have a budget of 20 million pounds a year. Um, we have four funding areas, civil and political rights, women's rights, minority rights, and social justice. And I wanted to talk about why we fund human rights, because I think it's important not to forget that. One reason, but not the most important one, is that it's effective, it's an effective way of making a small amount of money go a long way because you're holding governments to account. And that leads to a degree, potentially, of scaling up. But the most, the more important point is that we should not forget the history of repression in Europe in the 20th century. We had tens of millions of people dying because of human rights. <coughs> abuses. And that's where the discourse of human rights came out of. We had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, in 1948, which led to the European Convention of Human Rights in 1952, and then eventually the Human Rights Act in this country in 1998. So there's not a democracy in the world which doesn't have human rights language in its uh, either constitution, in uh, one of the international uh, instruments that they've signed up to. So when we get accused, as we do, uh, of bending the law in terms of democracies, it's not a question of bending the law, it's a question of implementing the law. It's a question of holding governments to account to follow the legislation that they have themselves signed up to. Now, if you are a charitable trust, you have to, uh, you, you're bound by charitable law, you have to follow uh, 
the Charity Commission's view of this. Um, and the Charity Commission, uh, which is the body that regulates what is regarded as charitable or not, um, states that there is an obvious public benefit in promoting human rights. They say, for individuals whose human rights are thereby secured, the benefit is immediate and tangible. There's also a less tangible, but none, nonetheless significant, benefit to the whole community that arises from our perception that the fundamental rights of all members of the community are being protected. This provides sufficient benefit to the community to justify treating the promotion of protection of human rights, treating the promotion of human rights as a charitable purpose in its own right. And I think we shouldn't forget either that Britain's development goals is profoundly influenced by human rights. So when DFID is saying that they are uh, earmarking 30% of its funding, its entire funding for um, fragile and war-torn countries, and they're talking about uh, getting tens of millions of women, helping them to gain access to justice. Um, they're talking about promoting democracy. All of the things that they're talking about uh, is really influenced by the whole area of human rights. So um, I'll stop there. I want to throw it open straight to the audience, but I just want to ask one question to our panel as a whole. And it's prompted, well, it's prompted by a number of, of, of the questions, of the interventions that have been put. But I suppose partly by George's focus, so perhaps to the other three first. And I ask this question, is there something inherently different about providing support for litigation? I've just been thinking through your rather impassioned uh, defence, and it reminded me of the time when I had set up an NGO back at the right at the end of the 1980s, 1989, when climate change was just coming onto the agenda. And we were four fairly young characters who went to the Ford Foundation with this idea that um, 